Good evening, class. <clears throat> those sitting in front of me and those who are watching at home. And um, I just want to say something to the person who said they're very concerned about me because I am not wearing a mask. Let me just say that um, it's very difficult uh, to teach. If I were to teach with a mask on right now, uh, you wouldn't hear me clearly. It would be muffled, and certainly it would be muffled on the camera mic. Um, so just, um, I would just also tell you for some of the people who know who were here, five years ago when I was going through very aggressive chemotherapy, I wore a mask all the time, except when I taught for the same reason. If I would wear a mask, it would be so garbled that you couldn't hear. And I have some people who have difficulty hearing even close up to me. So I am, I feel perfectly safe. I'm fully vaccinated. I um, take precautions, but for your benefit at home so that what you're hearing on YouTube and through our website so that you can hear the teaching, uh, I am uh, what I am and God's grace is uh, bringing me through. So thank you for your concern, but uh, I am so concerned about you that I want you to be able to hear what I'm teaching, okay? So we welcome all of you tonight. We are in the sixth chapter of the book of Romans. And if you have prayer requests or comments, uh, please feel free to Call the church at 330-453-2519. Let me know you're watching. Let me know if you are having any uh, questions or you have a prayer request. And we certainly are praying for some of our uh, in-person class members who uh, are ill tonight and those who are on vacation and will soon be uh, back with us. But if you're there, hopefully you have your Bibles. Hopefully you have printed out the notes. If you can't print out the notes and you want them, all you need to do is just give us a call at the church and we'll be happy to mail those to you. Okay, we are in the 17th verse of the sixth chapter of the book of Romans. But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. So the word obeyed, of course, is hupa kosate. It, in, this, in this form of hupakui, this word means became obedient. We became obedient. And the aorist tense points to an action that has been completed. In other words, it's in the past, and the action has been completed at a definite time in the past. And that time was obviously when these Roman believers faithed in the life-giving gospel of the grace of God. So there was a time that you obeyed. Now that word means that they had given wholehearted obedience to the gospel to which they had been delivered. And this is a very interesting verb. It's paradothete. It's Strong's 3860, for those of you who want to do further study by looking it up in your Strong's uh, Greek dictionary. It means handed over, committed, entrusted. Now, the gospel to which they had been delivered, in other words, that they had been handed over, committed, entrusted to, includes all the doctrine that Paul taught in the book of Romans. So they, and I would say us, we have been delivered, handed over, committed, entrusted to the sound doctrine of the gospel and, and even the doctrine that is taught 
in the book of Romans. Now, as a result, they possessed a new nature. And it's the new nature, Paul is telling you, it's the new nature which enabled them to obey their new master, the Lord Jesus Christ. Sin is no longer their master. They're now serving the Lord. <clears throat> now, this verse emphasizes the importance of the heart. You obeyed from the heart. The heart is very important. The heart is the control center of our being. And I am obviously not talking about the fist-shaped muscle in the center of your body. I'm talking the center of your being. The heart was always referred to as that center of everything. It's the control center. And so Paul is speaking about more than intellectual acceptance. It's not just, oh, yes, I, I, I understand that. I, I accept that. And he's talking about more than stoic obedience. You know, the gritting your hands, I don't want to do this, but I guess I will. Somehow I'm going to get this done. No. The fathers <laughs> new obedience comes from deep within one's new heart. Because remember, that's something that God promised in the <coughs> Old Testament. He would give a fleshly heart, not a heart of stone, but a fleshly heart. <coughs> one is, which is indwelt by a new power. So there's a new power in the control center of our being. New power. Now the heart forges our personality. Personality comes from where? The center of your being. That's why sometimes you fall in love and you tell the object of your love, well, I love you with all my heart. You have my heart. Well, it's because the heart forges our personality. The heart forges our intellect. Unless you say, no, 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 we divide it up. You only think with your mind, not with your heart. If that's the case, why when Jesus was confronting the religious leaders and Pharisees, did he say, why reason you in your hearts? Because they, oh yeah, they 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 were they were having they had a, a feeling, an idea, a thought process, but Jesus knew exactly what they were reasoning about. So the heart forges personality, it forges intellect and actions. You know what is in your heart will eventually come out in action. So the heart is the driving force in preferring good or evil. Jesus said what? Out of the heart comes all sorts of evil things, right? And out of the heart can come good things. Out of the heart can spring good water. And out of the heart can flow stinky water. Now, making core decisions, core, C-O-R-E, core decisions comes from the heart. Those decisions that go to the deepest part of our being. Do you know the old time fathers uh, really knew this? When they penned a song, Into My Heart, 
into my heart. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Because basically, and that was, again, was not just something that, kind of a cutesy thing, but they had hold of something. They knew that if the Lord came into your heart, the control center of your being, there was a power in you that was greater than anything that could reside in your heart. If the Lord is at the center of your being, where you make your core decisions, where you forge your personality, where your intellect and your actions flow forth, do you understand what it means then to say, I have Jesus in my heart? Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. And by the way, don't just come to visit. Just don't come to just pass through. Come in today. Come in to stay. Now, form is the Greek word tupon. And it's pattern or mold. Pattern or mold. That form of doctrine to which you were delivered. So the form, and you know how you know forms uh, were made. So the gospel is the mold. It's the mold. It's the form. And Paul is saying now. He, now here's the beauty of this. What he said in using this word tupon, he's saying. God pours his new children into the mold of divine truth. We're poured into the mold. And then, what do you, if you've ever made candy, you know, you use molds, right? And you form it. Do you understand what's happening to you and I? God has poured us into the mold of sound doctrine, and then he's pressing us into that mold. And then what happens if, when the candy is done? We pop it out. And so, as we have been pressed into this mold of sound doctrine, what should come out of every believer is an understanding of sound doctrine. Some doctrine. So new faithers have an innate and compelling desire to know and obey God's word. And I want to uh, read a scripture to you from 1 Peter. 1 Peter 2.2. 2. As newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Desire the word. You know, I have a little skepticism, or no, I'm not going to back that up. I have a great deal of skepticism toward people who say they are Christians who say they are followers of Christ, but do not have a love for his word. Because that's how you grow up. You'll never know the will of God if you don't know his word. And so if, if, if people have, listen, I understand. I understand being sick. I understand working. I understand schedules. But if you call yourself a Christian and you are doing other things at a time when you could be studying the Word of God, I have a little bit of skepticism regarding your commitment. And sometimes I, I have, you know, people say, well, this person got saved. And it's okay. And uh, we never see them. Now, if they've gone on to another fellowship, that's fine, as long as they're somewhere studying the Word of God, serving the Lord. 
But so many times, we don't see them at all. Do you understand what I'm saying? And another thing is, well, I don't have time. I don't have time to get anywhere and study the Word of God. I don't have time to read my Bible. Then you kind of wonder, have we, do we have somebody who was a stillborn spiritual birth? Here's why. A baby, and mothers will know this, a baby when they are born, immediately want to feed. You don't, unless there's a problem with a baby, you don't have to teach a baby how to suck. They're ready to go. Okay? They're ready to go. Why? Now, 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 Peter was making an analogy. I want you to see the analogy. If that baby does not want to feed, then there's something wrong with the baby. Peter is saying, as in the same way as newborn babes desire milk, a newborn spiritual babe should desire the Word of God. Desire the Lord. Desire knowledge of the Word. Desire truth of the Lord. Why? Because without it, listen, if that baby can, can, um, cannot eat, I and mean, this goes on, there, there's a diagnosis of that. It's called failure to thrive. In the same way, a, someone who, who embraces salvation and does not have a desire to at least start with the milk of the word and work on through the meat of the word, they have a failure to thrive spiritually. And we see it all the time. People who have supposedly been in the church for 20, 30 years have not the slightest idea what God's word says. See, you cannot lay hold of a promise that is yours until you know the promise. You cannot believe that healing is the children's bread until you have read those scriptures that say he is our great physician and by his stripes we were healed. You don't know you have a right to peace in no matter what situation until you know the promise of the word of God that says peace is yours. I have given you my peace. My peace I leave with you. You don't even know what you have because you have embraced salvation if you don't know this word. And so that, and it says you were delivered unto this doctrine. You were entrusted to this doctrine. Now the teaching. The word that here is uh, doctrine. It's didakes, Strong's 1322. And that teaching to which they had yielded themselves had stamped its own impress on them. So if, you, if you've seen something um, in, a, in a factory, they, there's a stamping. And what they do is they stamp it when it comes out. It's done. And you look like the stamp. Well, the gospel was what? It was like the mold, and now there's a, the t doctrine is now stamping. And there's an impression on, on, on you pressed into that sound doctrine. So you look like sound doctrine. You sound like sound doctrine. As the fathers had honestly responded to the impact of the gospel teaching, they came under the influence of the teaching. Remember that doctrine, the gospel, that's what we have been delivered to. We were delivered to this, paradocente. This was the, the Lord gave this teaching to Paul and the apostles. That's true. However, the language in this passage of scripture 
says that we believers have been delivered to this teaching. Now, I want to talk a little bit about this word uh, delivered. Um, the verb delivered, and I have to do a little bit, not much, I promise, not much, but a little bit of grammar. So, this word delivered uh, is the second person plural. So that would be you, right, you, but it's plural you, meaning not just you, but you, okay? And the Greek text reads, the form of doctrine into which you were delivered. And the form of doctrine into which you were delivered was what? That which Paul and the apostles are, are proclaiming, which is the word of God. And so that is really salvation. In salvation, God constituted the believer according to uh, to this chapter that we're reading, these, these verses, in salvation, something happened to you. God made you so that inwardly you would react to the doctrines of grace by a new nature, right? Your new nature loves this word, right? Your new nature loves God. And so you were constituted so that you would react to this by that divine nature that has been planted to you. What happens when you're saved? God implants a deposit of the divine nature in you. And so as a result, you are constituted then to receive and obey them. You can read the word of God and say yes. And you're, you're drawn, right? You're drawn to obey. Someone else can read that unsaved and say, I don't even understand that. That doesn't even make sense to me. You understand what I'm saying? Or you before salvation. Well, I don't, I don't, I don't. Did you ever try to read the Bible before you were saved? Just because someone said, oh, it's a good book, you should read it. And you say, mm. It depends on when you start to. A lot of people start with Genesis. <laughs> And they get so far, and then they get into the begets, beget, 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 beget. Yeah, I don't get into that. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't get into this. I, I don't get anything to this. So we'll start with John. Oh, this is too confusing to me. But once you were saved, it was like you know, something happened inside of you. It's because God constituted you to be able to understand, receive the doctrines of grace by your new nature, and they, there was a desire to obey. So Paul thanks God that whereas before salvation we were, aren't you glad for the word part? Yes. We're slaves of the sin nature. We were in salvation delivered, handed over to the teachings of grace so that we could become slaves of righteousness. That's a beautiful, beautiful thought. Now I need to give you the corollary to this. Witness Lee, and that he is actually that was the name he took. And he was founder of what is called the local church movement. And he wrote a book that was entitled Christ versus doctrine. Now let me just share something right there. The, the title right there tells you what, there's something really wrong with it, okay? And the main thesis of his book is this, a personal relationship to Christ that matters uh, and doctrine actually interferes with that relationship. Now, you first hear that, oh yes, a personal relationship to Christ matters. Yes, it does. But notice where he goes next, denigrating doctrine, denigrating the word of God. And I'm gonna tell you that this book not only is unbiblical, but as one 
can easily guess from the title, Christ versus Doctrine, it's also self-contradictory. Doctrine is simply another word of teaching, for teaching, nadaki, teaching. And the purpose, which is kind of interesting, the purpose of this book, by the way, was uh, for Lee to teach his own teaching, his own doctrine. <laughs> and the sad thing about this is that this same air is floating across the church world today. You don't need the word. You just need to just bathe in Jesus and your relationship with him. You don't even know what your relationship is without with him word. without the word. <laughs> Always beware. See, everything must pass through the filter of Scripture, the Bible. has to pass through the Bible. So when people come around to you, oh, all we need is just to be floating and floating and hanging from the chandeliers, but we don't need the Word of God, always beware. Always beware. So I want us... Um, now to go to, uh, I'm going to read 18 through 20, and then we're going to start with 18. But to just set this, the context. And having been, having been, having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness and of lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. So in verse 18, we see that Paul continues... Uh, to personify sin. So sin continues to be personified as a harsh tax taskmaster. And by the way, sin is a hard taskmaster. You can't, you cannot serve sin and live an easy life. It's impossible. And that harsh taskmaster is from whom fathers had been once and for all time set free by the payment of the price of redemption. We've been redeemed. We have come out of the slave market of sin. We have been bought and paid for and set free. And having been set free, and this is something we need to look at, at very clearly because in the seventh chapter, Paul will get into much more detail in it. But Paul is not saying that the sin principle has been eradicated. But that sin is no longer the saved person's master. See, the sin nature has no power over us. Only, only as we continue to trust in the work of Christ. You have to trust in the work of Christ, that it is complete, it is finished. That nothing more, Christ doesn't need to do anything more to redeem you. And you need to realize that we are dead to sin and alive to Christ. That is our identification with Christ. You cannot be a, a Christian if you do not identify with the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ. So having been set free, now we've become slaves of something else. <clears throat> Both of these verbs are in the passive voice. And the passive voice means what? It's done to you. Okay? We have been acted upon by a power outside 
of ourselves to bring about the effects of both verbs. When we were slaves of sin, there was a power, the old sin nature that acted upon us to make us slaves of sin. Now there's been a new power, the power of the redemption that is ours, that has now caused us to be slaves of righteousness. We have been set free, elotherothentes, and say that 20 times. <laughs> Can't say it once. Strong 1659, elotherothentes, and it means to cause someone to be free, cause. Your salvation through the atoning work of Jesus Christ caused you to be free from domination caused you. And then as we continue to faith in the completed work of Christ, there is a constant pull of the believer toward righteousness. See, the more you recognize what Christ has done for you and in you and through you, the more you will have a desire to do what? Follow that path. See, freedom in Christ is not an invitation to self-centeredness. It really is not about me. And it's not about you. It's about him. And see, we have been freed from sin in order that we might give ourselves to righteousness. Give ourselves to it. Think about that for a minute. We have been saved and redeemed and freed from the power of the sin nature so that we could give, give ourselves. I'm gonna give, we hear much about that. Well, I'm gonna give myself to this work. I'm gonna give myself to this charity. I'm going to give myself to, to just wholeheartedly do this. Well, we've been freed from sin in order that we might give ourselves wholeheartedly to righteousness. So in order to live our lives for God, guess what? We must learn to lean on the Holy Spirit. Have you ever just, I mean, you've been so determined to do something, even as a Christian maybe. I am so determined I'm going to get up at 6 a.m. and I am going to pray for one whole hour. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it from now on. Any, anybody ever try that? You were real sincere, right? You were really sincere. And maybe you did it Monday. And maybe you kind of crawled and did it on Tuesday. But how many of you got harder and harder? You see, because you can't do it. You cannot do it just by gritting your teeth and saying, oh, I'm going to get this done. I'm going to live for God. I'm going to do this. But have you ever been moved upon by the Spirit of God and you just began to pray, maybe you began to worship, maybe you began to intercede for something, and before you knew it, you had even exceeded the time that you tried to do on your own. Why? Because you have to, you have to rely on the Holy Spirit. We have to allow Him, here's the key, allow the Spirit of God to live through us. That's why we say, Holy Spirit, we're welcome here. Flood this place. And change the atmosphere. But you know what we're talking about? We're not talking about, an, I think before we can ever talk about this atmosphere, we've got to talk about this atmosphere. Holy Spirit, you're welcome here. Flood this place. Flood every nook and every, every cranny of my being and change the atmosphere. Your presence, Lord, is what I really desire. I desire your presence in me. And that's, that's what is needed. It's not that we are doing it because we determined to do it. It's we're learning to lean on the Holy Spirit and allow him to live through us. See, 
sometimes I think we sing songs and we don't realize that there's more to what we're singing. You know, that precious chorus, there's a river of life flowing out from me. But before the river of life can throw, flow out from us, therefore with joy shall you draw waters out of the well of salvation and there is a, a well that has to be springing up in you. And that is, Jesus spoke of it and said what? He's speaking of the Holy Spirit. He said, if you're thirsty, come and drink. For out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. And he spoke concerning the Spirit. The Spirit cannot flow out from you until you learn to lean on him and allow him to live through you. Now, righteousness is a word with which most of you are very familiar. Strong's 1343, Dakaiosune. Now, in biblical terms, righteousness is that which is acceptable to God. And there's the key. And it's in keeping with what God is in his character. God is. So if we're going to look at this word in this sense, dikaiosune, which is righteousness, and it is translated righteousness, one of the problems with the English translation of the Bible is that, unfortunately, English does not have uh, some proper words to declare this. And sometimes what gets uh, mixed up in the English translation, it is not mixed up in the Greek translation, but often it gets mixed up in the English translation is between justification and righteousness. And so they, sometimes that gets muddied in the English translation. And that's one time where I would say it is well uh, for you to use your strongs concordance and then look up in the dictionary is it is it truly a justified word or is it truly a dikaio word it does make a difference yeah, for example let me give you one from from Romans just from the last chapter of Romans Romans 5 1 in your English Bible you will read therefore being justified by faith we have peace with our Lord Jesus Christ I mean, no, that's not how it reads in the Greek. It's therefore being dikaiosune, therefore being righteousified by faith, we have peace. So I, that's just a little sidebar. I, you know, we have them available here, but I, you know, we're not hawking them. But if you want them and want a Hebrew and Greek dictionary where you can look up those words by number and so that you can do some Bible study on your own. We have them here. All you have to do is just call and let us know and we'll give you the information on how to get them. So, it's acceptable to God keeping this character. Now, in this sense then, righteousness is the opposite of hamartia, which is sin. So you have righteousness, you have sin. And sin is defined as missing the mark set by God. By the way, not missing the mark you set for yourself. Because you can say, well, I'm pretty close. Yeah, it looks like I'm, I'm really pretty close. And you might be a mile off. And by the way, we have all fallen short of the mark of the glory of God. Because you know who the standard is. You know who the glory of God is. Jesus. And I hate, I, I, want, I hate to tell you this, but none of us can be compared with Jesus. So the subjection to righteousness, and this is the truth, it's perfect liberty. It's perfect liberty. Because outside of that, you're always trying what? You're always trying to measure up. You're trying to do it in yourself, and you're always falling short. If you are trying to measure up to the mark and the standard of God, you will, in your own 
in your own efforts, you will always fall short. And you will always be frustrated, always miss the mark. Knowing that your righteousness comes through your faith in the work of Christ, believe me, that's freeing. That's liberty. Now, I want us to look, I'm going to read it in uh, the 19th verse, and I'm going to read it tonight in New King James, and then I want to read it in the Amplified, and I'm going to read it in also West translation. So, I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh, for just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness and of lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. And the Amplified <coughs> says, I am speaking in familiar human terms because of your natural limitations. Everybody's just saying, you know, scripture's saying, well, you, you know, there's only a limitation to what you can understand. For as you yielded your bodily members and faculties as servants to impurity and ever increasing lawlessness, that means breaking the law, so now yield your bodily members and faculties once for all as servants to righteousness, right being and doing, which leads to sanctification, set-apartness. And I would just, I, I put that set-apartness. Um, the Phillips translation says, I use an everyday illustration because human nature grasps truth more readily that way. In the past, you voluntarily gave your bodies to the service of wickedness for the purpose of becoming wicked. So now give yourselves to the service of righteousness for the purpose of becoming good. And then West. I am using an illustration drawn from human affairs because of the frailties of your humanity. For just as you placed your members as slaves at the disposal, okay, in other words, to be used whenever wanted to, of uncleanness and lawlessness, resulting in lawlessness. Thus place your members as slaves at the disposal of righteousness, resulting in holiness, set-apartness. And I would say yielding yourself to the Lord and his working in you, okay? Here's the key. We do the willing yielding. It's willing. We do the yielding. But the work of setting us apart is the work only God can do in us. And I'm going to say it again because we've got lots of people trying to run around trying to be holy. To do, do enough things to be holy. I'm going to, be, I'm going to work at being holy. No matter what you do, you will never be holy by any effort of your own. All we can do is to yield to the work of God. And if you will go through the Old Testament, through the New Testament, you will see that the setting apart, the sanctification, the holifying, if you will, the, the holiness buying, is done only by God. It is a work that is done by God. So, Paul said that he was speaking, I'm at note 24, Paul said that he was speaking as people do in everyday life. So in using this metaphor of slavery, Paul was implying that our wills were enslaved. Isn't that true? You know, it wasn't a matter you woke up one day and said, oh, I, I, I think I'm, I'm going, I am going to will to sin today. No. We have, you know, we have no will in the thing at all. You just kind of, well, all we like sheep have gone astray. We're less like sheep. 
And sheep are very, very easy uh, to lead into things. There's a reason why they're called sheep. If you can, if you can get one sheep, one sheep, to put a stick out in front of that, that sheep, and get that, train that sheep, that one sheep, to jump over the stick, take the stick away, and not only will that sheep still, still jump in that location, but every, every, every part of the, one of the flock behind you will do the same thing. It's, it's true. It's the nature of sheep. Maybe they'll just do it. Have you ever asked anybody, well, why did you do that? I don't know. Well, they did it. I just, they just did it. I just followed along. You know, the, the, the best, the, one of the best stories to illustrate that about all we like sheep, we are sheep. We just do it. Whatever we see someone do, we do. You know, the story that there was the great grandmother, great grandmother gets married and she's going to cook a roast for her husband. Only the roast was too big to fit the roasting pan. So she cuts off both of the ends. And she then she puts it in, she puts it in, and eventually her daughter watches her fix a roast. She all, her mother only had the one pan, the one roasting pan. Well, she gets married, and she's going to fix a roast for her husband. And so she gets the roast, and she has a nice big roasting pan. She gets ready to put the roast in, she cuts both ends of the roast off, puts the roast in the pan, and she does all the things she saw her mother do, bake the roast. She has a daughter, and she's fixing a roast for her husband. And she gets her roast out. She's got a huge roasting pan. She's, she has the roast. She still cuts off both ends of the roast and puts it in the pan. Does all the things that juices the recipe. So they're having a family gathering. So the grandmother's there, the mother is there, and the daughter's there. And she's in the kitchen doing that. And finally, her husband walks out. He said, why are you cutting off the ends of the roast? You know, you know, probably because there was a lot of fat there. And that's the part that sometimes you don't really like. You know? So why are you cutting that off? She said, well, that my mother did cut it off. Didn't you, Mom? Mom, you cut it off? And she said, yes. She said, well, why did you do it? She said, because Mom did it. And so finally the grandmother speaks up and says, well, the only reason why I did it was because the pan wasn't big enough. <laughs> now you've got three generations. Now think about that. You know, it's funny, we laugh about it. But do you understand, that's a good illustration of we just do things, and that's the way it is when we were slaves of the sin nature. Our wills, we didn't have a will, but we just went, well, that's just what you do. That's what you do, and that was where my inclination was. I didn't have to think about it. I, I, that was just where the direction I was going. We were bound to do sin. Because our wills were enslaved, and we are bound to do sin or bound to do righteousness because by nature, and here's the key, when we were in sin, by nature, we saw the rewards of sin. Does sin have pleasure? Yes, for a season. It just doesn't last. So we're bound to do sin, we're bound to do righteousness, because by nature, we either see the rewards, or I would say the pleasures of sin for a season, or we see the beauty of righteousness as more attractive. And when there's a change in nature, then we begin to see the beauty of righteousness. I guarantee you that none of us, when we were in sin, saw the beauty of righteousness. In fact, we probably had the idea, well, that's a bunch of silliness. Let's face it, most people 
in under under the sin nature would say that that that's that's ridiculous. You're going to get taken. People are going to take advantage of you if you if you believe that. You need to get all you can and can all you get before someone does you in. Or you need to do something to somebody before they get a chance to do it to you. Is that not the way of sin? Yes. But what you need to do is to see the beauty of righteousness more attractive. And you do. Why? Because what has been implanted in you is a deposit of the divine nature. And it sees the beauty of righteousness. And then he says weakness. Because of the weakness of your flesh, that's asthenian, asthenian. And this word describes a state of incapacity. You're not, it's, you're not able, you're incapable to do or experience something. And in this case, as it is used in this scripture, it refers to our limited human nature. Limited human nature. Yes. 24? Sure will. The question was to repeat 24, so I'm going to repeat it. <clears throat> Paul said that he was speaking as people do in everyday life. In using this metaphor of slavery, Paul was implying that our wills were enslaved. <coughs> they were. We are bound to do sin or bound to do righteousness because by nature we either see the rewards of sin or the beauty of righteousness as more attractive. Yeah. Thank you. Ah, you're welcome. Note 26, and I'm going to probably finish with this one tonight. Flesh here is sarcos. Strong's 4561. And sarcos does not refer to the physical flesh. It refers to that complex, and that's supposed to be C-O-M-P-L-E-X, not S. That complex of human sinful desires that includes ungodly motives. Is it possible to have ungodly motives? Yes. Affections, A-F-F-E-C-T-I-O-N-S, affections. Principles, are there sin sinful principles? Oh yes. Purposes, words, and actions that sin generates. Can sin generate ungodly motives? Can sin generate ungodly affections? Oh, yes. What about generating ungodly principles? We live in a culture where we're seeing that all the time. And certainly purposes. And words. And actions. And it does it through our bodies. Because your brain is how it's in your body, right? So if you're thinking and purposing things in here that are ungodly, do you understand sin is generating that, that sin nature? So it describes the outlook that is oriented toward self. And really, that's if you go back all the way back to the Garden of Eden, wasn't that the the tactic? that Satan used through the serpent. Damn self. Hath God said, I want to tell you. You know why that God said, don't you touch this tree? 
and you can touch all of the others and eat off of all the others. You, can, you have free reign with all the others. But this is the no-no tree. Don't touch the no-no tree. No, he just said don't eat from that tree. I want you to know why. It's because God wants to keep you down, down, down. He wants to hold you down. Because he knows in the day that you eat from this tree, you'll be just like him. Now, what was that appealing to? Self? I don't want to be held down. I don't want to be held down. I'm going to lie. And you realize in, in listening to that lie, Eve really went down. If she had remained true to God, she would have done nothing but thrive and strive and strive. But sin does that. Orient towards self. And by the way, our self is prone to sin. Left to our own devices. That's one of the, you know, if, if you've never read this book, and I, and I would just simply say, if you want a good illustration of this very thing, the sin nature, you know, just going wild, read the book, Lord of the Flies. Lord of the Flies. Oh, they had a real good idea at the beginning. Oh, wow, just go here and be free. And it, it, just, it just devolved into chaos. Why? Because that's what happens with sin. And that's what, because the self is prone to sin, which is opposed to God and which pursues its own ends in self-sufficient independence from God. Is that not where our culture, for the most part, is today? Self-sufficient, we don't need God. Independent from God, we don't need, we don't need anything but ourselves. When you think you don't need anyone but yourself, you are in big trouble. So we're going to pick up at note 27 next week. And uh, aren't you glad that we were slaves to sin? But now we aren't. You say it again. Aren't you glad we were slaves to sin? Yes. Now we aren't. And so uh, we have been delivered to the power of the gospel. If you would like to write a comment, uh, give us a comment about uh, what you received from the class tonight, or if you have a prayer request, or if you have a question about something that we have discussed in tonight's class, feel free to call us, 330-453-2519. We would love to hear from you. Please let us know that you are watching the class at whatever time you replay it, uh, from wherever you are watching it. We want to hear from you. We love you. We pray for you. And even though we have never seen some of you, you are in our hearts, and we are lifting you before the throne of grace. And walk in the grace and the gospel of grace into which you were delivered, and have a wonderful, blessed evening.